pleasure to be here, Benny Mazaltov. Then, uh, before I'm going to introduce the meeting and the speakers, I only want to say a few words. Then, I am here as a psychiatrist because of you. Then, uh, because I was very close to leave psychiatry. When I was starting first psychiatry, there, it was very psychoanalytic, and then I thought this is not for me. Then uh, I met Benny Padasa. Then, then we went, he went to his Ratnashim, and I went to work with him. And then he and other mentors, but they, especially you. Then uh, I, I, I learned that you can put clinical and research together, but this is what I do until today. Then, then uh, I also learned how to interview patients. Sometimes when I'm interviewing patients, I have a deja vu. Okay, I'm using your style. Okay. But then it's, again, you deserve. That's the reason, that's the main reason I'm here. Thank you. Okay, then I will introduce first uh, Professor Ofer Agit. Professor Agit is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. He is the director of the schizophrenia program at the Center of Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, uh, where he works as a staff psychiatrist and a clinical scientist. His main, main research focus is in the treatment of schizophrenia, psychopharmacology of schizophrenia, and the mechanisms of the pharmacological treatment of antipsychotics, mainly using brain imaging techniques. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Thank you so much, Benny. One small anecdote about Benny. 25 years ago, when I was still with the orthopedic surgery department in Hadassah, I met Benny through Ronen Segman. And Benny, we, we spoke a little bit, and he told me that uh, he heard the time with orthopedic surgery and said, what, you're with orthopedic surgery? I wouldn't survive there even one hour. The next day, I switched to psychiatry. <laughs> and since then, I'm here. So I will talk about treatment-resistant schizophrenia. We'll start with receptors, a little bit of history, and no. <laughs> Let's try again. Any idea how do I move the slides forward? Oh. Thanks. So this will be the objectives. I'll talk a little bit about the history, a little bit about treatment resistance, and then about clozapine, which is the only medication, only psychopharmacological compound that we have indicated for treatment-resistant uh, schizophrenia. This is my disclosure slide. So uh, I'm working, I'm an advisor for most of the pharma companies, uh, major pharma companies uh, advise that are working on new psychopharmacological compounds for uh, treatment of psychotic disorders and schizophrenia. <clears throat> Whenever I talk about the treatment of schizophrenia, I like to start with Benjamin Rush. Who is Benjamin Rush? Benjamin Rush considered to be the father of American psychiatry. Um, maybe you can recognize his face because that's the logo of the American Psychiatric Association that he founded. Benjamin Rush is the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He uh, wrote the first textbook in English. And he wrote there about the treatment of schizophrenia. How do we treat schizophrenia? Back then it wasn't called schizophrenia, but based on the, the description, you can understand that he was talking about schizophrenia. What was the main advantage, what was the main contribution of Benjamin Rush in the logo of the American Psychiatric uh, Association? for the treatment of schizophrenia. That's a spinning chair. According to Benjamin Rush, we should spin the patient up until he will lose conscious, and then the patient will get better. Past treatment to schizophrenia included also artificial hibernation. Patients were put to sleep for days and days and days in order to fix, quote unquote, this disruptive behavior of psychosis and schizophrenia. And insulin coma, insulin coma was given in my hospital, downtown Toronto, up until 30, 40 years ago. 
It was very popular. And bathing therapy, usually with ice. So the patient was put in ice. And as you can see, adherence with treatment was very important, even back then. So the nurse was put there was to make sure that the patient is adherent with treatment. And then came the frontal lobotomy. Frontal lobotomy was a hit. So a, a metal probe would be put here in the eye socket of the patient. Back then, there was no any kind of imaging technique. So according to the mood and how much time the neurosurgeon had, they simply destroy the frontal lobe of the patient. It considered to be a very elegant technique, a very successful technique. It became very popular all over the world, even in Israel. Uh, it was given to some of the patients. The guy who invented it, Iges Smonitz, won the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize for Medicine, 1942, not so long ago. And only God knows if 20, 30 years down the road, somebody will not stand here and show the audience the treatments that we are giving now to the patient with schizophrenia. By the way, Iga Smonitz was shot by one of his clients. <laughs> I don't know if before or after the frontal lobotomy. <laughs> the revolution came in the early 50s with this compound, chlorpromazine, and with this guy, Henry Labori. Henry Labori was an anesthesiologist. He was working in France, in Paris, in a hospital, military hospital that exists up until today. He was an anesthesiologist looking for new compound for anesthesia, add-on compound. And he came across this molecule, chlorpromazine. He saw that it's kind of sedate the patient, but not exactly sedate the patients, make them tranquilize. And uh, he tried to understand the mechanism of action. He saw that it impacted many, many receptors in the brain. So he called it large action, large acti, large action. We have it up until today. Two psychiatrists were, that were working in a hospital that, again, still exists in Paris, and Marie Michel in Paris, France, Delay and Danny Care, tried to give this compound to the patient. And for the first time, they saw that there is an impact, an antipsychotic impact, thanks to this compound. Chlorpromazine. And they published it. And this is the first publication in the interesting June 23rd, 1952, 62 years ago, when Benny was 10. <laughs> and uh, sorry, four. <laughs> yeah. And they said antipsychotic medication, there is a compound that actually control psychosis, the disruptive behavior, voices, delusions, and so on and so forth. There is a compound that can control psychosis. Hundreds of papers were published. Hundreds of PhD works were published over the years afterwards, trying to understand the mechanism of action of this antipsychotic. How an antipsychotic work, how a compound can control thoughts. Hundreds of papers were published. They were all wrong. Up until the early 60s, in 1963, a guy by the name of Arvid Carlson published this paper. And he said, you know, antipsychotic medications probably work by blocking dopamine. Arvid Carlson from Sweden considered to be the father of dopamine. So here is another Nobel Prize from the year 2000, if you may, a more legitimate Nobel Prize for Arvid Carlson for dopamine. And since then, we know that in order to control the antipsychotic the psychotic symptoms, antipsychotics work by blocking dopamine. Phil Simon, our Phil Simon, from the University of Toronto, narrowed down the search for the mechanism of action of antipsychotics, and he said, well, there are five subreceptors of dopamine, but only D2 receptor is the most critical receptor for controlling anti the psychotic symptoms, delusions, and hallucinations of the patients. And up until today, despite the fact that we have many antipsychotic treatments, different receptors are impacted by those antipsychotic medications. We know that the most critical receptor that we should block in order to get the antipsychotic action is the dopamine 
D2 receptor. And the dopamine D2 receptor is actually sufficient. The FDA, for example, one of the FDA uh, 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 rules is to ask for the compound that they approve as an antipsychotic to be a dopamine D2 blocker. And the question that we should ask is where? Where in the brain we should block dopamine D2 receptors in order to get the antipsychotic action? Where in the brain do we have dopamine D2 receptors? This is a tricky question because the answer is we have it all over the brain. So if we look all over the brain for the most critical brain region in where we will block dopamine D2 receptors, I think that it will be first to summarize the antipsychotic action of antipsychotic by saying that antipsychotics block dopamine in the striatum, here, caudate and putamen. Now, despite the fact that we have around 66 different antipsychotics in the world, and around more than 20 million people diagnosed with schizophrenia all over the world, we know that there is a subset of patients with schizophrenia that will not respond to treatment. They will continue having psychotic symptoms despite being adherent with the <laughs> anti-psychotic treatment. Some of them will have it from the outset, right from the get-go. We will give them antipsychotics, whatever antipsychotic you want, but they will stay psychotic. Some of them will develop it over time. So these are previous responders, ex-responders, if you may, to antipsychotics, but still they develop over the years some kind of resistance. What does it mean, develop resistance? We don't really understand what's the brain mechanism behind it, but here is one example that comes from our uh, clinic. We treat antipsychotic, we treat first episode patients in one of our clinics in the schizophrenia programs with antipsychotics. We give first line antipsychotics. The patient responds, usually neuroleptic, first episode patients respond robustly to treatment with antipsychotics. We can see it in this time response curve. Patients respond robustly, but as usual with these patients with schizophrenia, they relapse due to non-adherence. They go home, stop medications, relapse, come back psychotic. What we did with these patients, we renew the same medication, exactly the same medication, and we rate their response. But this one, this time, it was diminished, almost as if something happened to the brain. Well, in a way, it doesn't make sense. It's the same patient, same doctor, same nurse, same treatment, same dose, same compound. But something happened to the brain after relapse, and those patients develop some kind of resistance, almost as if we can subtype schizophrenia based on response. We can say, okay, there is this subset of patients, around 70% of patients, who will respond to antipsychotic medications, D2 antagonism in the striatum. A subset of patients will not respond to the D2 antagonism, but will respond to clozapine. And God knows what is the secret ingredient of clozapine that make it different from other non-clozapine antipsychotics. But another subset of patients will not respond even to clozapine. We call them URS, ultra treatment resistant schizophrenia. <coughs> so let's look at this subset of patients who are not responding to D2 antagonism, D2 full antagonism. Who are those patients? We call them TRS, treatment resistant schizophrenia. Who are these patients? So let me show you some lessons we learned from our database, because thanks to Benny, I developed a database that Benny taught me many years ago to develop an algorithm-based database. So every patient that comes to our clinic, we routinely rate him based on rating scale like BPRS, CGIs, different types of CGI. We give second generation antipsychotic because it's better for first episode patients. Another second generation antipsychotic is a line number two. Very quickly, all the patients that respond, we recommend switching to long-acting injectables, LAIs, because LAIs are better in relapse prevention compared to oral medications. But very early during the course of illness, if there is no response, we switch to clozapine. 
And we can see, this is one of the lessons that learned from our algorithm, is that first episode patients, around 70, 75% will respond robustly to treatment. Second line of treatment here, only minority of patients will respond. But the third line, when we switch them to clozapine, a large subset will respond. Why? What is the secret ingredient of clozapine there? Here is a Japanese group that came to us. We were mentoring them. They went back to Japan. They developed an algorithm with three lines prior to clozapine. Again, you can see the same story, like a stubborn subset of patients that will not respond. So they tried first line, second line, minority uh, achieved remission with second line, third line, nobody achieved remission. And then to clozapine, again, robust response. So what is the secret ingredient of clozapine? You know, the devil's advocate might say, maybe the trial is shorter, too short. Let's make a longer duration of the trial. This is what we did. We have here patients that had first line of treatment, second line of treatment. They were offered clozapine here. Some of them refused. No change in the clinical response with the same medication. Only those who switched to clozapine responded. Again, a small subset of patients with a different brain, hypothetically, and the secret ingredient of clozapine. We even tried to increase the dose. So we took the subset of patients who are not responding, make a longer duration of trial, increase dose of risperidone or lanzapine in this case, it didn't work. It didn't work. They are stubborn, resistant to treatment. And only when we switched to clozapine, we saw response. Here is a meta-analytic study that tried to look for something that is very popular among clinicians when they see TRS, combinations of therapy, polypharmacy, different antipsychotics. Let's combine all the different antipsychotics, higher dose, different dose, and so on and so forth. It doesn't work. There is no added value besides increasing side effects with polypharmacy. Only clozapine stands out. So if we summarize all the data that we have, there is a resistant subset of patients. What do we know about their brain when we are looking at the brain of those treatment resistant? How are they different? So we know that antipsychotics Dopamine blockers uh, uh, make non-TRS patients to respond. What about these TRS patients? Here is an interesting brain imaging study that actually tried to measure the striatal dopamine synthesis. What's going on in the synthesis of dopamine in the stratum, the most critical brain region? So they looked at three groups. They measure first the dopamine activity in healthy control brains. They have a certain level of dopamine synthesis activity. Then they took patients with schizophrenia who responded to treatment, responded to antipsychotics. And hypothetically, and not only hypothetically, these patients usually have increased level of dopamine. And this is what they found increased level of dopamine. Then they took the TRS patients, patients who are not responding to any compound. I'm not talking about clozapine right now. They are simply not responding. Measure their dopamine in the striatum. Normal dopamine in the striatum. Almost as if we're talking about a different illness. This is not schizophrenia. This is not dopamine schizophrenia. It's a non-dopamine schizophrenia. While we are mistakenly treated it as schizophrenia. Here is another study that comes from our lab. We used fMRI DTI in order to try to understand what's going on in the brain of these patients. What is fMRI DTI? That's a very elegant measure to look at, to measure the speed of the water molecules in the white matter, in the neurons. So we know that every brain activity, if you may, every thought we have, is related to shift movement of water molecules. So the water molecules actually goes hand by hand with any other substance, any other compound we have in the brain that represent brain activity. So 
Let's go back to this picture. This is the stratum. And what we try to do is actually the measure the speed of the molecule. To the, what, what does it mean, the speed of the water molecule? Actually, we are looking for, if you may, traffic jams in the brain. So, you know, in Toronto, we have the 618 use a helicopter that goes around the, around the GTA, the greater Toronto area, every morning reports of traffic jams in the highways. Here we have Galgalats. It's the same story with fMRI DTI. What we are looking is, we ask the software to color in green if the water molecule are flowing exactly the same as different subtypes of patients with schizophrenia or healthy control. And if we ask the software to color the roads in the brain, the thoughts, if you may, with any color different than green. So look at this picture that I mentioned before, the stratum, and this is the brain from this level. So this cut is, this picture is actually the brain if you look from above. And now let me show you a normal control where we measure the water molecule. So we want the roads to be open green, if you may. Thoughts are driving. This is how it looks like. This is a normal control from one of our studies. So you can see the green means brain activity. If you may, thoughts are working there. Brain activity is there. But then we compare this picture and this set of pictures to different subset of patients. With TRS, we focus on TRS. We try to understand what's going on with TRS. So again, green means traffic is flowing. Any color other than green means a traffic jam, if you may. So we can see here healthy control versus close-up in responders. So these are TRS patients that responded to close-up in. As you can see, there are some traffic jams there, quote unquote, of course. Then we can look at healthy control versus close-up in non-responders. These are patients with close-up in, sorry, patients with TRS that received close-up in but did not respond. So remain psychotic with delusions, hallucinations, and so on and so forth. You can see again those traffic jams there. And then we compared close-up in responders to close-up in non-responders, but the brain was green, no traffic jams. So Let's try to summarize what we found here. It looks like we have two schizophrenias, if you may, two illnesses, separate illnesses from this perspective only. We have to be very cautious. We are all scientists here, so we have to be very cautious. And we can argue that in a way, there are two subsets of patients with schizophrenia, two brains, one that respond to D2, but then and we will see it through the fMRI DTI, and the other is not. And we have to remember that this TRS patient, some of them, maybe the majority, will respond to clozapine. So how clozapine? Let's try to connect it to clozapine. How clozapine is related? What is the secret ingredient of clozapine? Clozapine is a very interesting compound. It was developed many years ago. As one of the antipsychotics was developed in the era when nobody knew how antipsychotics work. There were a lot of theories, that I, as I showed you before, and every drug company came with an antipsychotics. Clinicians didn't like it at first. Why didn't they like it? Because back then, many years ago, the dosing before the PET positron emission tomography time, we didn't know about the dopamine D2 occupancy in the striatum. So the dosing was based on EPS, a, a rigidity. If the patient is rigid as a board, that means, or Parkinsonian, that means the medication is working. Clinicians didn't like clozapine. It didn't produce EPS. Patients received it, got less psychotic, but were not Parkinsonian will not respond with this rigidity. Clinicians say, well, it's not a good antipsychotic. But it was working. It was working very well, despite the fact that it was not uh, uh, causing EPS symptoms, Parkinsonian symptoms. So clinicians started to call it atypical. Why atypical? Because there is no EPS. 
drug companies, they're always quick. We say, ah, OK, we have an antipsychotic, which is atypical, no EPS. Let's make more clozapine-like atypical antipsychotics. And this is what they did. They started developing more clozapine-like atypical antipsychotics without EPS. There is a story that one of the marketing guys, there is an urban legend that one of the marketing guys in one of the pharma companies said, you know, it's not sexy to call a medication clozapine like atypical. Let's think about a more sexy name. And he came up with second generation antipsychotics. And this is how the second generation antipsychotics came to the world. Now, what happened to clozapine later is very interesting as well. Eight patients from Finland died from agranulocytosis. Up until today, we don't understand how is it possible. It's so rare to get agran. And eight patients in the same batch in Finland, somewhere in the 70s. Overnight, the FDA said no more clozapine. And all the clozapine was removed from the shelf. Almost every, overnight, clozapine was banned. What happened is the antipsychotics, the patients who were on clozapine, were switched back to first generation antipsychotics, to the antipsychotics they never responded to. And they relapsed despite adherence. They became very psychotic. It became a problem. There is a subset of patients who are very psychotic, and we cannot give them clozapine. But they responded to clozapine. John Kane, my friend from New York, went to the FDA and said, listen, we must bring back clozapine. How are we going to do it? The FDA said, you know, design a study. Show us that there is a subset of patients that respond only to clozapine. And we will agree to bring back clozapine with hematological monitoring. And this is what he did. He took patients, gave them chlorpromazine, haloperidol, huge doses, gave them clozapine, showed robust response, and coined for the first time in the 80s treatment-resistant schizophrenia. He said, probably, hypothetically, we're talking about an illness. We call it schizophrenia, but the truth is, this is not schizophrenia. This is TRS. Probably, they respond to clozapine different. They have a different mechanism of action. So what is the secret ingredient of clozapine? Clozapine is a very dirty medication. It impacts any receptor and sub-receptor you can imagine in the brain different subreceptors, different impacts. So what is the secret ingredient there that we can say this is, oh, what happened? Sorry, press the wrong button, I guess. Yeah, so he said this is probably, hmm. I'll tell you the story behind the slide. <laughs> so what is the secret ingredient of clozapine? This is what we try to understand here. And um, the first thing that we should ask is, what about the D2 receptors in the stratum? Remember, the most critical brain region, the most critical subreceptor, is the dopamine D2 in the, in the stratum. Maybe, is it possible that those TRS patients are actually because of God knows why their dopamine D2 is not blocked, only by clozapine. So this comes from different labs all over the world. They compare the receptor dopamine D2 occupancy in the stratum between TRS and schizophrenia patients without TRS, and they show no difference. So the problem is not D2 receptor. This is not the D2 receptor. What about the D1 receptor? As we know, Clozapine, and this comes from our lab in Toronto, clozapine has a little bit different impact on D1 receptor. Maybe D1 is the secret ingredient of clozapine. So one of the drug companies developed a D1 receptor antagonist, but there was no antipsychotic activity. It's exactly like placebo. So D1 is not the secret ingredient of clozapine. Let's go back to score one. What about D3? We have a lot of information, a lot of data that clozapine impact D3. Maybe D3 is the secret ingredient of clozapine. No, it's not. Here is another study, D3 antagonist, 
It's not the secret ingredient. It doesn't have any quality of antipsychotic, definitely not for a, a, a patient with TRS. So we have to go back to square one and look at this time at D4. D4 was very popular in the 80s and the 90s. A lot of clinicians, a lot of researchers show the signal of clozapine on D4. And in the textbook from the 90s, you can see that the secret ingredient of clozapine is D4. And one of the drug companies came with D4 antagonist, this compound which was a big failure. A lot of money was wasted. D4 is not the secret ingredient of clozapine. We have to go back to square one. And this time, let's focus on 5-hydroxytryptamine. 5-hydroxytryptamine is actually what's behind the typicality. When we think about how is it possible that clozapine does not produce EPS, the answer is probably 5-HT because First generation antipsychotics block D2, but second generation, the atypicals block D2 plus 5-HT2, and 5-HT2A regulates dopamine. So in a way, second generation antipsychotic clozapine like push and pull in terms of dopamine, and that is probably the reason why we give clozapine but don't get EPS. But this is not the TRS compound. This is not what we are looking for. What about other 5-HT2 subreceptors? This is a very large fa family <clears throat> of receptors that clozapine impact. And again, I don't want to bombard you with the information. There is a lot of data here about how clozapine impact different 5-HT2 subreceptors. But if I summarize all the studies that try to augment or treat with the 5-HT2 compounds, the answer is it doesn't work. Definitely not as an antipsychotic. Definitely not for TRS. What about clozapine metabolism? You know, when we give clozapine to the patient, the enzyme in the liver break it down to clozapine and norclozapine. Maybe norclozapine, which is the major metabolite of clozapine, is the secret ingredient of clozapine. So norclozapine was bought by Acadia, and this is the said report to the stock market in New York City of Acadia after they tried norclozapine as the secret ingredient, and all the results were negative. We have to go back to square one to look for the secret ingredient. What about glutamate? We heard a lot about glutamate. Glutamate is a very popular item and we have a signal of clozapine that impact glutamate. So what's the story of glutamate? We have a lot of clues when we think about antipsychotic compound for schizophrenia from the glutamate family. For example, maybe we are talking about hypofunction of the glutamate, the NMDA system. We have a lot of clues. The PCP, angel dust, ketamine, which are models for schizophrenia, including the positive and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And glutamate system is a very complicated receptor system. It contains the metabotropic glutamate receptors, the presynaptic receptors, different groups of receptors, AMPA. KNET and NMDA are the main key players. It starts with AMPA and KNET. They need a, a, a glutamate to be activated to depolarize the membrane. This is how the glutamate system starts working. And then the NMDA, in order to remove the magnesium plaque, we need glutamate and glycine, and we need the AMPA and KNET to depolarize the membrane so the magnesium plaque will move away, and only then the NMDA can start working. So maybe this is the secret ingredient of clozapine. Let's refresh our memory with the dopamine pathways in the brain. You know, we have the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Our understanding is that there is too much dopamine activity there related to the positive psychotic symptoms. We have the mesocortical, where we have hypoactivity of dopamine. And we have nigrostriatal, responsible for the EPS, but normal level of dopamine in the schizophrenic brain.
and the tubero infundibular. In a way, this summarizes the tragedy of the psychopharmacology of schizophrenia. We have normal dopamine here, too much dopamine there, too little dopamine there, and we have only one shot to fix them all. How do we do that? How can we fix everything together? So maybe through glutamate, because if we look at the glutamate pathway, the glutamate control the dopamine pathway. So for example, if we will look at the hyperactive dopamine neurons that are related to the overactivity of dopamine in the stratum, in the mesolimbic dopamine pathways, the positive symptoms, it is controlled by glutamate. And, glu and the same with it is controlled directly or indirectly through benzodiazepine receptors. So glutamate is very promising, but here is the problem. The problem is that during the last 15 years, drug companies invested billions of dollars to look for a compound that will manipulate the glutamate system and hypothetically give us some kind of advantages in antipsychotic. So this is the list, we call it the graveyard list. This is like the graveyard of studies and compounds. You see on the board billions of dollars that were wasted without any resolution. So glutamate is not probably the secret ingredient of Clozapine. We have to go back to score one and look for a different a, 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 a family of receptors, for example, GABA. Now, GABA have two sub-receptors. We have the GABA-A. We know the GABA-A from benzodiazepines, but this is not the secret ingredient. Benzodiazepines like activity is not the secret ingredient of clozapine. But we have also GABA-B. And GABA-B, clozapine manipulate GABA-B, and through GABA-B we definitely have some impact, and maybe hypothetically this is the secret ingredient. So let's see, what about GABA-B? So here is another failed study. GABA-B is not the secret ingredient of clozapine. Now, manipulation of GABA-B will not work for those TRS patients. We're going back to square one, this time with acetylcholine. <laughs> very large family of receptors and clozapine impact each and every sub-receptor. However, these receptors are related to side effects. 